for the final part of the uh, uh, meeting today, uh, we will have all four speakers uh, spotlighted. So on the virtual stage, stage to have, uh, well, mainly also a discussion with each other. Um, so welcome back also to Gavin, Dimitris, and uh, I think Nelly will be spotlighted as well. Um, yeah, so I'm, I'm, a, I'm curious to hear, um, especially for those of you who were here also during the talks of the others, uh, your thoughts about the, uh, the other presentations you've seen and whether you think that, that you learned something there that you can also uh, incorporate in your own uh, models. So anyone wants to go first? Um, well, uh, perhaps I can go first since I was talking anyway, <clears throat> but uh, I think one element that uh, I could take from uh, the first two presentations is the spatial element. Uh, like you might realize that we haven't included that and well, to some extent, uh, we can justify it by saying the Netherlands is a pretty small country. Um, uh, I think if we were modeling the United States, we wouldn't do that. Um, but uh, I, I think um, the first two presentations showed very nicely how you can take the spatial component into account and what challenges there are with that. And that's something that I think is very important and sometimes kind of over overlooked. So that's something that uh, I really enjoyed uh, listening to the presentations. Yeah, and, and, and that's, sorry, can you hear me? Yeah, we can. Yeah, and that's something that we we kind of were interested in from the very beginning, um, and and the difference in kind of populations within different areas. But as someone um, helpfully pointed out in the the questions to my session, of course, the more um, fine resolution space you use, and if you're interested in the whole of the United Kingdom, or you know, you just give an example, of the United States, of course, comp computational challenges do kind of grow quite considerably. And I think our, um, you know, the focus in some of the talks on on uh, having more uh, um, kind of compartments in the model, like the different types of hospitalization, I think is fantastic. But then I began to think about, well, we could kind of try to incorporate that type of thing as well. But then computationally, again, I think it would get uh, quite complex. But again, I think there are two ways of dealing with computational problems. One is go by a bigger computer. Um, which is the, you know, the easy and yet unsustainable uh, approach. And the other is um, to start thinking, you know, more, more carefully about the computational kind of aspects and whether we can just be a bit more efficient. Yeah. Um, thanks. Um, Dimitri, sir, do you have um, something to add to this or? No, I, I was not present in the other ah, people's uh, presentation, so I cannot uh, comment on that. No. Okay. Um, and I think Nelly, you you were, uh, so let me, you're still muted, but I think. Yes, thank yeah. you. Yes, so what I uh, was very interested in uh, other presentations is how parameters are estimated and fitted. Because uh, now that we are trying to uh, stay a little bit closer to reality and our goal is to incorporate different data sources in the model and provide something informative for policymakers, then of course what they want to look at is how, how well your model predicts. And it is um, so messy and so hard to predict uh, COVID-19 with any precision. However, there was a huge improvement after instead of taking parameters like from educated guests or literatures in some very aggregated way, we started estimating parameters based on the past. And I saw it back in the presentations of um, Dimitris and uh, Yako. And that was and that was for me very interesting because um, I believe there is something in it. Um, and what I also would be very interested in, and that might be more related also to Gavin's presentation, uh, is how to combine all different data sources together. Because every data source gives you specific information that has specific place in the model. But um, some, what we encounter now that some data sources are very hard to incorporate uh, into the model in a reasonable way. 
So this is also something that we are thinking about right now, and it was very interesting to see what other people are doing in that direction. Yes, um, I think so. Um, yeah, I think it's almost time to uh, finish off, unless someone uh, out of you four wants to oh. Yeah, uh, Gemma. Yeah, I think I think that's a really good point. And we, we get asked all the time, how do you calibrate your model? And in the example I gave was back in the dark days of last year, at the beginning, you know, there was very limited data, but now we have historical data. Um, you know, strictly speaking, again, it might be a computational challenge. We could do some proper kind of calibration of the parameters in the model, because we take them from literature and you know, like you said, independently build these things together. But I think there is scope now to kind of do things in a much more kind of formal and coherent way. Um, we haven't done it because uh, we're still struggling with other things, but I, I think it's certainly something we'll need to do because as you said, policy making, the first question is how well did your model fit what happened last year? Um, and we're not quite there yet. Yeah, go ahead uh, Nelly. I, I keep keeping this online politeness that I have educated myself to mute myself anytime I don't speak and now I have to unmute me every time. But I want to ask one idealistic, futuristic question to, to others actually. So there is so much effort going on concerning modeling and prediction of COVID-19. Like today we saw like four different versions of this, right? So um, is it really necessarily a good thing? So when I observed all these talks, I thought, OK, one thing to justify is that every, every model has its own purpose. For example, I saw a model that predicts economic impact. And that's something else. Then, for example, our goal is to see how mobility plays a role. So that could justify different models. But at the end of the day, do you believe in something like good and sound machinery that well in some way we all try to contribute to that will be just suitable for for this epidemic uh, because it is probably not the last outbreak do you what do you think will happen to all these models will they converge to something or will they keep diverging depending on the purpose what what will be the future of all this effort that is so massive and so distributed at this moment uh, I have something to say on that, um, if that's okay. So, um, first of all, it was the first uh, experience in my life for where we adapted the models as we had more data. So, so th this is the case where um, the model, I, I, I could see four distinct type of models where we added something substantial, not different parameters, different components of the model. And the reason is we didn't have, this is a, a new novel disease, which we did not know how it, would, it behaved. Uh, so that's one. The second is very recently, I have started uh, studying um, a new set of, uh, uh, of viruses uh, that J&J &J is, uh, is thinking of developing vaccines. And the knowledge we have acquired because of that, very different, very different. It's not an epidemic, it's just developing vaccines uh, and finding places for them. But uh, the knowledge that we had because of the effort on COVID-19, not the models per se, but the way we did it has been beneficial. So instead of taking us months to develop, it took us days to develop because we adapted our, our understanding of the previous. Uh, so I, I definitely believe that earlier knowledge would help us in the same way that at least the models we have developed were very much influenced by some work we have done in Ebola in the past. So, um, so I, I, I honestly believe that all of our, this is a collective statement that um, our joint understanding of how to model things would influence, this, would influence us positively in the future as it has been the case of the, as I mentioned with the Ebola virus and the RVS virus as well. Yeah, thanks. Um, it's really very interesting. Um, I'm not. If one of the other four uh, others still wants to say uh, add something, uh, please go ahead. And I'm looking at screen. I'll um, maybe yeah. add. Uh, and I agree with that last comment. Um, it was the first time in my career, a that we've worked at quite that speed, um, uh, yeah. but also in kind of 
adapting the models as we went along to bring in different components. And I think I mentioned in my talk at some point we were asked, could you model what happens when potentially uh, tourist season happens and populations start to mix coming out of lockdown? You know, that was an entire new component of the model um, that we uh, think about very quickly. And I think it was, it was almost um, like we, I, I, in some ways it was a great experience because the innovation came through the need and the limited time availability. I'm not sure I'd want to do that every year, um, but, uh, and there were, there and things like uncertainty, um, you know, we knew we wanted to propagate uncertainty, uh, a certain amount of it from the very beginning, but what we'd normally do is a kind of rigorous scientific uh, uncertainty quantification and propagation and given the time scales we had to get some results out you know the first attempts were you know not quite as good as we'd wanted to do you know but they 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 provided information where no information was available which i think was a big step uh, and it was almost like we are uh, the bit we did after those initial runs was almost kind of backfilling the bits that we'd wanted to do anyway um and and what we did find i don't know if the other speakers found this is there were lots of requests for a model that did everything for everybody. Um, and it was sometimes quite difficult to kind of rein that into things that were both practical and actually kind of scientifically valid as well, without really just sticking a straight line through things. Thank you. Um, yeah, I'm just looking at the clock now. Um, I think it's time to, to wrap this up. Uh, um, but of course, you're all very welcome to uh, join at the wonder.me uh, uh, social pet platform in a bit uh, where we can have uh, drinks. Unfortunately, I can't offer you proper drinks or a proper dinner, but for me, this was an excellent day. I, I really learned a lot and it was very interesting. Uh, and for some closing words, I now want to give the floor to uh, Guus, one of the uh, members of the organization committee. Thank you, Thank you very much. I share my screen. Firstly, Casper, I very sh short. I I will thank. I want to thank you personally for uh, being the host uh, today, uh, this afternoon. Um, th th thanks to you, everything went very smoothly. Secondly, without the speakers uh, and uh, the award winners and the juries, uh, yeah, the, the 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 afternoon wouldn't have been as as, as interesting as it has, and. Uh, I want to thank uh, Romy, uh, Ale Romy, Alexandra, and, uh, and Jan Keck for, for doing the technical moderation uh, this afternoon. And I also want to thank the, the board for making this meeting possible and, and uh, having, well, trust us to, for organizing uh, this meeting. And we, that's, that's Nikki, who's the engine in, in our team, I, I'm very, uh, I'd like to express how much I, I, I um, enjoyed working in this team and Laura was always uh, a human touch uh, adds a human touch to everything and Yorike who even uh, continued communicating about this meeting uh, even though she was admitted to the hospital uh, some days ago couldn't stop her from communicating um, finally thank you for being here we have a, a small questionnaire. We, we can put it in the in the in the chat uh, uh, in a moment. Uh, we would like we, we well to our opinion we had a perfect program this year, but we know we there's always something we can improve, and we need you to to find out what it was. And um, yeah, please give us uh, feedback now or, or maybe tomorrow we will send, send an, an email to you with the, with the, uh, the link to the questionnaire. And your meeting is finished now. We can continue in the, in the virtual room, like uh, Kasper said, uh, it's the, the Bitly uh, link. You can put that in the, in the chat too. We hope you enjoyed it. And I hope you, we will uh, meet again next year. Wish you the best. Bye. Thank you very much, Guus, for uh, guiding us. <laughs> and uh, indeed, I hope we, you all had a nice meeting, and I hope to see you also. So, yes. Thanks, Laura, Guus, uh, Nikki, Jorike, and all others. And 
I hope everyone, especially those who signed up early, got their snack box. Oh, you can't see it because it's hidden. So let's all meet each other in a few minutes in the wonder.me room. And thanks for organizing this great day. <laughs>